section eleven of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by kate fallis edmund dantes by edmund flagg the communist part two apropos of state prosecutions against le national said louis blanc that was a most exciting time when ruin was brought by tears before the court of peers for a libel on that most august and erudite body ay and a most liberal honest and honourable conclave the thrice sodden and most solemn knaves and mules cried rollin ruin at the bar demanded armand carroll for his defence continued louis blanc to refuse was impossible but a bitter pill must it have been to tears and Mignet to consent they must have foreseen what came both now in the ministry only four years before both had been in le national tears as a colleague of carroll and Mignet as a collaborateur the files of the journal were produced and lo there stood paragraphs proven to have emanated from the pens of the prosecutors far more libellous and venomous on the august peers than anything ruin had published you all remember the scene that ensued and won't forget it soon no nor shall we soon forget that noble passage in armand carroll's defence said flocon in which he evoked the shade of marshal ney and from the wild excitement that followed one would suppose that it had really risen in the hall bleeding and ghastly and pointing to its wounds like the ghost of banquo to blast his hoary jewelled and noble assassin who seated on those very seats had sentenced him to an infamous doom carroll was instantly stopped but General Exelmans rose in his seat and pronounced the charge true. It was then reiterated with tremendous applause from the galleries. How Carroll escaped punishment for contempt is not known. Ruin was convicted of libel on the peers, of course. His sentence was a fine of ten thousand francs and imprisonment for two years but of what words did this famous libel actually consist asked ledrue rollin louis can tell you better than i said flocon why the words were severe enough no doubt replied louis blanc but tears and Mignet had themselves expressed the same ideas a hundred times though in less powerful and pointed language the passage which seems particularly to have given offence was this that in the eyes of eternal justice and those of posterity as well as in the testimony of their own consciences these renegades from the revolution these returned emigrants these men of ghent these military and civil parvenus these old senators and spoiled marshals of bonaparte these procureur generals these new-made nobles of the restoration these three or four generations of ministers sunk in public hatred and contempt and stained with blood all these seasoned with a few notabilities thrown in by the royalty of the seventh of august on condition they should never open their lips save to approve their master's commands all this farrago of servilities was not competent to pronounce on the culpability of men seeking to enforce the results of the revolution of july it was not until the commencement of eighteen hundred thirty five i think said marist that ministers opened a general onslaught upon the parisian press le republican was interdicted that year it was then too that the laws against public criers and newspaper hawkers were instituted as far back as thirty three however roddy had braved all such prohibitions by selling and with impunity too his own paper in the streets in may of thirty five came on the general prosecution of the press rollin was advocate in the defence there were warm words between armand carroll and his friend dupont the lawyer and there was at one time apprehension of a duel 
the position of armand carroll with tears his former colleague was at that time a singular one remarked rollin each seemed to be on the constant search for opportunities to exasperate the other the editor assailed the minister in his columns and the minister retaliated by an arrest carroll censured and ridiculed tears though he respected his abilities and tears feared and hated carroll though he admired his talents it was about this time that fieschi exploded his infernal machine at the king was it not asked flocon tears arrested carroll then i know it was on the twenty eighth of july of thirty five at ten in the morning on the boulevard du temple this was the second attempt on the king's life the first having been that of bergeron in november of thirty three carroll was arrested as an accomplice it was pretended for every one of these attempts has been attributed to the whole body of the republicans while they were utterly ignorant of them until they took place and then bitterly denounced them but the government has made capital out of all these insane attempts and against the opposition too i've heard it asserted said rollin that the government got up some of those little exhibitions of fireworks for that very purpose they are quite harmless so far as the old man is concerned wonderfully so and fieschi was made a perfect fool of so ridiculously lionized was he by king court and ministers our friend marie was advocate for that wretched old man pepin fieschi's accomplice more a ghost than a living creature you are entirely right friend rollin said louis blanc in the idea that every one of these attempts strengthens the government and recoils on the opposition no one should so vigilantly and vigorously watch for and suppress such attempts as we heaven defend the old despot from the assassin's weapon as it seems well inclined to do or the deed will surely be attributed to us every unsuccessful attempt at assassination is viewed like an unsuccessful attempt at revolt on the part of the opposition and injures our cause accordingly better never to attempt than never to succeed do you think it true louis as was reported asked marist that as soon as the smoke of fieschi's explosion swept off and the old man found himself standing unharmed amid a heap of slain and mangled marshal mortier and colonel roussac being among the killed his first exclamation was this with ill-conceived gratification now i shall get my appendages and the dotations for the boys nothing is more probable said louis blanc that old man has but one impulse selfishness and but one attachment to his family his family because it is his his purse and family have for years been his sole objects of love to aggrandize his own has been for years his sole end and aim he parcels out the thrones and kingdoms of europe among his children as if it were but a family estate what thoughtful selfishness exclaimed flocon and at a moment too when he had but just escaped an awful death and all around him flowed the blood and lay scattered the lacerated limbs of his faithful servants either dead or dying with groans and shrieks of most agonizing torture and all because of himself how disgraceful that at such a terrible moment his first thought should have been of the few more francs his trembling hand was striving to tear from a people by whom he had already been made the richest man in europe and which the occurrence of this dreadful event might serve to win for him well said rollin whether this event aided to win the appendages and dotations and was so designed or not it is very sure the aforesaid appendages and dotations were secured no wonder that such attempts succeed each other so rapidly one every year at the least when was the next louis that of alibaud i think that took place about sunset on the twenty fifth of june thirty six was the reply alibaud discharged a walking-stick gun at the king as he left the tuileries on his way to neuilly at the corner of the port royal that alibaud was a mere boy and a very interesting and intelligent boy too but for some mysterious cause he did not find favour with the court as did fieschi 
he evidently attempted the assassination from conviction from a feeling of manifest destiny after his failure he only wished to die and to die at once all who have succeeded alibod have been but vulgar cutthroats in what year was the insurrection of armand barbus and martin bernard asked flocon that proved most disastrous to our cause that was in thirty nine may i think answered rollin barbus blanqui and bernard were arraigned as leaders marie and myself were advocates for barbus blanqui was sentenced to death and barbus to the galleys for life but we obtain commutation of penalty for both and where is to be the end of all these things asked marist gloomily as he continued pacing the chamber with folded arms his head resting on his bosom are the ten years on which we have now entered to be characterized by the fruitless efforts of the past are the people of france again and again and again to strike for freedom only to be stricken into the dust and trampled beneath the armed heel of a despot's myrmidons are the streets of lyons paris and marseilles again to be drenched with the life-blood of their dwellers poured out as freely as water and as fruitlessly are we all again for full ten years to toil strive struggle and suffer to be hunted down like the vilest criminals and like criminals plunged into the most pestilential dungeons to be stripped like slaves of our hard-won earnings and to be deprived of the most humble franchises of men claiming it all to be free to be treated with scorn and contumely and to be debarred the exercise of those common rights which like air and water belong to all i say brothers are all these scenes to be repeated during the ten years on which we have now entered as they have been witnessed during the ten years now past you speak sadly armand observed rollin not so sadly as i feel i have listened with attention to the recapitulation of the political events of the past ten years in france and most plainly and as sadly as plainly does the result prove that every movement in our cause has been as premature as it has been unsuccessful may we not gather wisdom which shall conduct us to success in the future from the very errors and disasters of the past remarked flocon alas despondingly replied marast what is there in our present to promise a bright future more than was in our past to promise us a bright present our great leaders of another generation have all left us one after another all have dropped into their graves the cold marble has closed over their venerable brows and they rest well yet they died and made no sign of hope on us young inexperienced and rash has devolved their task but the mantle of their power and virtue has not alas descended with that task to aid in its momentous accomplishment general lamarck's sun went down in clouds midnight deeper than egyptian darkness brooded over the delirious deathbed of lafayette armand carroll fell without hope and are we wiser than they how often oh how often have i listened to the words of wisdom that fell from those eloquent lips even as a boy reverently listens to a parent for such was armand carroll to me upon this very spot have i stood in that very chair has he sat that chair which with mingled shame and pride i reflect is now filled by me shame that it is filled in a manner so unworthy of him pride that i should have deemed fit after him to fill it at all in that very chair i say has his noble form reclined when he for hours even from night till the next day's dawn dwelt with sorrowful eloquence upon his country's present and looked forward with gloomy foreboding and prediction for the future it almost seems to me that this mighty shade is with us now and why all this despondency my dear armand remarked louis blanc mildly was it not because our noble and gifted friend was essentially a soldier not a civilian not a statesman not a revolutionist had armand carroll gone to algeria he would have died 
if died he had not in an unknown duel with an unknown bravo he would have died a marshal of france a bougaud a chaganier a bedeau a cavagnac a clausel a le Mauricier. carroll had no faith in the masses to achieve a revolution he never believed that they could even withstand a single charge of regular troops much less repel and overcome it not even with barricades asked rollin not even in defence of barricades continued louis blanc regular troops have much to learn added rollin with a significant smile they will see the day ay and we shall see it and rejoice at its coming despite all melancholy prognostications when the people of paris will dictate abdication to the king of the barricades from the top of the barricades the people's throne nor will that event tarry long i doubt it not i doubt it not ledru exclaimed louis blanc rejoiced that one of the youngest and least stable of their number appeared free from the apprehensions of one of the most influential and seemingly most reliable i accept the omen indicated by your enthusiasm but i accounted for the vacillation and distrust of our lamented friend armand carroll by reverting to the fact that he relied entirely on regular troops military skill scientific tactics and severe subordination now all of these belong to our oppressors and none of them to us and inasmuch as he could not perceive that enthusiasm passion for freedom love of country and family and the very wrath and rage of desperation itself sometimes not only supply the place of discipline arms and the knowledge requisite to use them but even enable vast masses to break down and crush beneath their heel the serried ranks of veteran troops he could only despair at the prospects apparently before him besides armand carroll like all military men was a man of action not reflection of execution not contrivance a soldier not a conspirator at the head of ten thousand veteran troops he would have charged on thrice their number without discipline with the confident assurance of sweeping them from his path as the chaff of the threshing floor is swept before the blast but with an undisciplined mob as he contemptuously called the masses he would have moved not a step the larger the multitude the less effective and the more impossible to manage he would have deemed it a revolution accomplished by means of the three arms of the military service artillery cavalry and infantry horse foot and dragoons he could readily conceive but a revolution conducted to a successful issue only by means of pikes axes muskets and barricades never to the hour of his death despite the victory of the three days could carroll comprehend besides said flocon it must not be forgotten that armand carroll though a most devoted friend to republicanism was never a member of the society des droits de l'homme was never as we all now are a communist a socialist a fourierist a friend to the labourer no wonder he hoped so little for the people and trusted to accomplish so little through them there can be no doubt that the social principle which republicanism is now unconsciously assuming all over france mildly remarked louis blanc is lending to the cause incalculable strength how terribly impressed with the conviction of the justice of the cause in which they perished must have been the unhappy insurgents of lions when with this motto on their banner to live toiling or die fighting they marched firmly up to the cannon's mouth and fought and thus fighting fell yet this conviction is not peculiar to the workmen of lions it pervades all paris all france and needs only to be roused to act with an energy which no human power can resist social republican will be the type of the next revolution in france it must be the french people have been dazzled by the mirage of liberty ever since eighty nine but it has been only a mirage on the last three days of july thirty the people of paris drove out one bourbon to enthrone another 
true the state is myself was not the despotic motto he assumed as did one of his successors but it was me and my family which has proved equally selfish if not so absolute and far more dangerous to freedom with lafayette and benjamin constant the citizen king they had made quarrelled as soon as on his throne and lafitte and dupont de l'eure his supporters were banished from the court casimir perrier was called to crush the liberals armand carroll assailed the act and urged a republic the national was prosecuted and insurrections followed thus was the revolution of the three days won by the people to be seized and enjoyed by the bourgeoisie the next revolution will be won by the people too but the people will enjoy it and how progresses our principles louis among the people asked marist who had listened attentively to every word that had been uttered never so gloriously as now armand never never has there been such a diffusion of information upon the subject of the rights of labour as now pognier tells me every day that volumes tracts and pamphlets on this topic disappear like magic from his shelves has not the minister a hand in this mysterious disappearance of communist literature asked rollin we all know he is quite frantic on the topic of popular education oh yes we all understand guizot's love for the people his system of education promulgated in eighteen hundred thirty three was so very beautiful that it was almost a pity it was utterly impracticable but guizot has very little to do with pognier's bookshelves or with pognier in any way except to prosecute him from time to time for publishing coromenin's withering tracts designed for the minister himself and yet it would almost seem there was a design to exhaust the market of the publications of our friends only the great mass of them go to the provinces and large quantities abroad my own little brochure the organization of work after having fallen still born from the press died a natural death and been laid out in state for a year or two on pognier shelves all at once is resurrected runs through half a dozen large editions and is translated into half a dozen languages the same is true of lamartine's vision of the future and the same of cormenin's tracts and of the ten thousand brochures on this same subject of communism in all its different shades and phrases and in every variety of size form and style of writing and appearance these publications are adapted to every test and comprehension the workman is suited as well as the savant all this savours of magic even my most sanguine anticipations are surpassed by reality there will never long lack a supply for a demand be that demand what it may a demand for fourier literature has turned all the pens in paris hard at work upon it novelists essayists pamphleteers while the port st antoine the port st martin and all the minor theatres where are found the masses swarm with melodramas farces and vaudevilles on the same subject and none of you have forgotten the powerful play entitled the labourer of lions attributed to monsieur dante's recently produced with such success on the boards of the francais itself and who is this monsieur dante's asked ledru rollin if you will suffer me to interrupt decidedly the most remarkable man in the french chamber of deputies replied marist in powers of natural eloquence i never saw his rival nor is that all added louis blanc unlike most men noted as mere orators he is a sound logician as well as a polished rhetorician as a political economist he has few equals to that subject he seems to have devoted much study while his familiarity with the political history of france and of the times generally all over christendom seems boundless in debate you observe he is never at a loss for fact or argument let the discussion take what direction it may and he has celebrity also as a writer has he not asked ledru rollin the author of the labourer of lions must be a man of distinguished literary genius was the reply 
better than all said flocon he is devoted heart and soul to the good cause such devotedness to a cause i never witnessed said marist he puts us all to the blush with him it appears a matter of direct individual interest he is perfectly untiring he is like one impelled by his fate love or vengeance could not force onward a man to the attainment of an object more irresistibly than he seems forced and that too without the slightest apparent stain of personal interest or ambition that man appears to me a miracle a pure philanthropist he strives struggles suffers sacrifices and all with the sole object of ameliorating the condition of his race it is indeed wonderful said rollin thoughtfully do you know marist anything of his past history little if anything of himself he never speaks and i can gather nothing from others even his constituents had known nothing of him but a few months before he became their representative in the chamber his popularity with them he owes to his efforts to ameliorate their condition at his own expense he established among them a phalanstery which is now in most successful operation his rich then asked flocon seemingly not to judge from his habits of life replied marist not a man in the chamber is more republican in garb manner equipage or residence than he and yet he may be rich is he married asked rowan he has been i am told said marist but we interrupt you louis you were alluding to the unusual influences now at work for our cause i was about speaking of the newspaper press said louis blanc never has there been known such a revolution in favour of reform and communist journals and to none is this better known than to some of ourselves there's flocon's new journal la reforme that has leaped at once into a circulation never before achieved but by long years of toil and enterprise the old national we need but to look around us to be sure was never more prosperous than now while i am free to confess that my journal le bon sens which has been a sickly child ever since its birth has within three months tripled its number of readers or at least its payers the same is in the main true of le monde by la croix la journal du poupel by dubose le courrier francais by chatelain la commerce by bert la minerve by la main la presse by girardine and all the journals in paris which diffuse true ideas upon labour and the rights of the people be they in other respects what they may even the charivari which views the old king and his ministers as fair butts of ridicule perceives a marked increase in its patronage since it commenced that course which sudden popularity naturally excites it to increase of zeal in the same path besides all this an army of new papers aiming to aid the great cause have not only sprung up of late like mushrooms in paris but all over france and even all over europe and so far appear they from interfering with each other's prospects that the more there are the better they seem sustained and the more ably conducted a swarm of new and unknown writers for the press on this great subject seems all at once to have appeared from unseen hiding-places this is very strange louis said marist and yet it is doubtless very true i had observed what you remark myself although i have viewed the movement less hopefully for the cause of the republic than you depend upon it armand said louis blanc smiling that republicanism and socialism are identical terms as much so as communism and despotism are antagonistic terms but how do you account for this wonderful change this unprecedented fever for fourierism asked flocon i don't pretend to account for it at all the merits of the cause have perhaps begun to be properly appreciated unusual efforts have been made by our friends of late whole nations and epochs are sometimes seized with a contagious mania for peculiar species of literature as for everything else but i will hint to you a suspicion which i have recently entertained namely that after all 
the rapid sale and ready market for every species of Fourier literature is not an unerring indication of the amount of reading of such literature or the demand that actually exists of buyers as well as readers individual ones at least as for the journalistic literature that i have learned is without doubt gratuitously distributed to a great extent among the masses but can the masses read the papers asked marist each family house neighbourhood cafe or cabaret at any rate has at least one reader said rollin and all the men women and children have ears to hear if not power to comprehend but some of these papers which i have seen come down in style to the very humblest comprehension can it be asked flocon that there is such a club as a society for the diffusion of social knowledge in paris after the form of that in london instituted by lord henry brougham and his whig coadjutors for the diffusion of general information and so opposed by the tories if there be such an association said louis blanc it has managed to elude all my vigilance thus far and that of the government too for guizot can perceive if no one else can the inevitable effect of all this and he has no idea that the dear people of france shall be educated by any one save himself but actually there seems to me to exist too much unity of purpose and action in this enterprise for it to be the work of an association i should rather suppose one powerful and philanthropic mind at the head of the movement were there not two things so plainly opposed to it as to forbid the idea the first being that there is no one man in europe who is rich enough to expend such immense sums upon such an enterprise if he would and the second that there is no man who has the subject sufficiently at heart to do it if he could end of section eleven section twelve of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg wait and hope just then a light rap was heard at the private door which marrast immediately hastened to open as if in anticipation of the arrival of a friend a brief and rapid colloquy ensued then m dantes the deputy from marseilles was introduced he seemed acquainted with and to be held in high regard by all present his dress as usual was black with a white cravat and his manner and bearing had all that magnetism and dignity which so deeply impressed those he met i find you in private conference do i not messieurs asked he glancing around with a smile i pray you let me not interrupt i've called but for a moment to speak with monsieur marrast respecting a measure in the chamber and have consented to enter only at his solicitation you are right monsieur dantes replied marrast in supposing us engaged in a private conference and upon matters of deep import though conferences in this office can never be so private or so important as not to derive benefit from the presence and counsel of the deputy from marseilles most true observed louis blanc and so far from intrusion do we view your arrival that we can but consider it most opportune that we have the privilege of referring to you a question on which between us especially between our friend marrast and myself there seems some little diversity of sentiment it would i fear said m dantes be unpardonable arrogance in one so young as i am in the great cause of human liberty to offer counsel to you who are all veterans and most of you little less than martyrs to your enthusiasm but no good citizen will shrink from the responsibility of declaring the results of his reflections on all topics which have reference to the general weal we differ mainly in this said marrast louis blanc attributes the republican failures of the past ten years to prematurity 
and want of preparation in our attempts and contends that all those reverses may be retrieved by patience and prudence in future while to my mind there is nothing to indicate for the future from the same causes different results than those experienced in the past concert of action said m dantes mildly is always an indispensable requisite in the accomplishment of every enterprise which relies for its success on association or the combined efforts of individuals labouring for a common end yet with all the concert of action which can possibly be attained the best arranged and best digested scheme in the world may be ruined by premature movement of this we surely have sad proof in the history of the past ten years alluded to there is something of truth in the declaration so frequently made that the french people are not yet prepared for freedom if this be so then it is the duty of their friends to prepare them it is folly to suppose that the masses should at first intuitively know all their rights and the best mode of vindicating them this they must be taught and to this end the press should be unceasingly at work not only all over france but all over europe in diffusing correct views upon life and labour and political rights and powers there should be also concert of action among the friends of freedom and clubs should at once be instituted in every city town and village in france which should be in private and intimate correspondence with similar clubs at paris and in all the capitals of christendom there should likewise be unity of action introduced among the masses themselves in a city like paris and among a people like the french secret signals can easily be arranged by which at any hour of the night or of the day fifty thousand labourers in their blouses might be concentrated at any point where their presence is required and that too with arms in their hands furnished from secret arsenals and thus would those pitiable slaughters of helpless insurgents like those of sheep in the shambles we have so often witnessed be avoided if nothing besides were gained the people are ever but too ready to pour out their blood and the most difficult and delicate task in our enterprise is after all to restrain them to impress upon them the all-important maxim without which nothing great good or enduring is achieved those three words in which all human wisdom is contained wait and hope and for what are we to wait and hope for which we have not already in vain waited in hope the past ten years asked marrast the true hour to strike was the firm answer and that hour when will it come it may come quickly as it will come surely soon or late it cannot be that the revolution of july should continue much longer to result in the solemn mockery it has it cannot be that its friends should much longer be withheld from those by whom it was achieved only to aggrandize one old man and his sons it cannot be that the unmitigated and disgusting selfism of louis philippe and his efforts to ally himself with every crowned head in europe not for the glory of france but for his own will much longer be overlooked or their perils masked the appanages grasped by himself the dotation and bridal outfit of the duke of orleans the dotation sought for the duke of nemours and his appointment as regent during the minority of the count of paris the governorship of algeria bestowed on the youthful and inexperienced omal to the insult of so many brave and victorious generals the naval supremacy to which has been exalted the ambitious joinville and his union to the opulent brazilian princess the effort to unite the young montpensier with the infanta of spain the environment of paris with bastilles with the avowed purpose of fortifying order by turning the ordnance which should protect into injury of destruction an immense standing army the notorious corruption of officials and the audacious dabbling of ministers in the stocks if not the king himself by means of information obtained by the government telegraph and withheld from the people or of information manufactured by the telegraph designed to effect the bourse 
the unprecedented number of placemen occupying seats in the chamber of deputies yet receiving exorbitant salaries as incumbents of civil offices one man being often in receipt of the salaries of several offices though performing the duties of none the fact that ministers have maintained majorities by unblushing bribery in elections that hardly one man in two hundred is an elector the profligate arts of corruption by which every able man is bought by the court the disgraceful censorship of the press and the drama the enormous appropriations for the civil list wrung out by grinding taxes from the toil and sweat of millions the absurd assumption yet the monstrous power over the press and its conductors of that conclave of hoary dotards called the chamber of peers the utter and most impious disregard of the deprivation and misery of the operative and labourer although arrayed side by side with the insolence and wealth pampered by the taxes torn from themselves the total forgetfulness of the self-evident truth of the right of all men to labour unrestricted by the baleful influences of the competition of capitalists these facts properly urged and set forth by the press from the tribune and in the clubs in connection with due enlightenment of the masses upon their rights as to labour and its reward and the duty of government thereupon could not fail to prepare the popular mind all over france and all over europe for reform for revolution unquestionably cried louis blanc such would be the effect and it would not only prepare the people for reform and stimulate them to obtain it but it would make them republicans true republicans american republicans the americans do not plume themselves on the title citizen but they work they dispute little about words but clear their lands they do not talk of exterminating anybody but they cover the sea with their ships they construct immense canals roads and steamers without jabbering at every stroke of the spade about the rights of man with them labour merit talent and honest opulence are honoured and rewarded aristocracies such republicans would furnish france more washingtons jeffersons and madisons and fewer robespierres dantons and marats there can be no doubt remarked flossant that the paramount interest in a republic is that of those who work that the labour question is of supreme importance that the profound problem now submitted to the industrial nations of christendom demands satisfactory solution and that the long enduring and most iniquitous miseries of those who toil must cease reform revolution and government which achieve not these achieve nothing they would be worse than useless the measures suggested by our distinguished friends seem to me eminently calculated to attain the consummation we desire a good government must and always will systematically uphold the poor and ever interpose to protect the weak against the strong said louis blanc the state should be tutelary for the ignorant the poor and the suffering of every description we must have a guardian government a government that will accord the aid of that mighty engine credit not to the rich only but also to the poor it must interpose likewise in the matter of industry and exclude that antagonistical principle of competition the poison found of so much virulence violence and ruin our maxim is brothers and in this do we all concur human solidarity and our motto unity liberty equality and fraternity all men are of one family and once thoroughly sensible of this kindred discord hate and selfism will no longer be possible the views advanced said le dru rollin so far as they tend to the elevation of the masses and to popular preparation for reform republicanism or revolution have my most cordial approval but i would beg to ask how long are the people to wait and hope when is to come the hour to strike who can tell said m dantes in his low clear and musical tones at what moment the breath will come which may hurl on its errand of devastation the avalanche which the snows and suns of centuries perchance have been preparing for its awful mission in the stillness of the night-time beneath the clear blue sky of summer or amid the ravings of the midnight tempest its dread march is ordered and in resistless crushing sublimity it begins to move on to accomplish its terrible errand who may predict the precise moment when the earthquake shall rock the tornado sweep the red lightning scathe or the lava flood desolate 
and who shall tell the day or the hour when the people in their majesty and might shall rise to avenge their wrongs the snowflake falls fleecily on the mountain's top through many a long and silent night a land green as eden smiles over the volcano through many a calm and sunny day the electric flame gathers in the firmament at length when least expected the avalanche sweeps the volcano bursts the red bolt strikes france is the victim of many wrongs which one of them shall prove the last drop in her cup of bitterness we know not france is divided into many political sects and all but one aim at revolution which one of all shall it be to set the ball of revolution in motion the legitimists who consider the duke of bordeaux the rightful heir and louis philippe a usurper the bonapartists who think they evoke the great shade of napoleon in the person of his unworthy descendant or the republicans as for the conservatives let them with guizot at their head uphold themselves if they can and let the dynasties under barreau and Thiers overthrow and succeed their factional foes their petty quarrels we care not for nor shall we the communists ever suffer ourselves to be deemed the revolutionary party but the revolution once commenced let us throw ourselves into its torrent and with our thorough perfect and secret organization we cannot fail to shape it most successfully to our own our righteous ends the hour when revolution may commence we cannot predict as it is not our policy to start or precipitate it but that hour may come quickly it must come on the demise of louis philippe which event cannot be long delayed and it may be precipitated before nor will france alone be convulsed as the news of that old man's death on the lightning's wing spreads over europe the electric wire will prove but a train passing through repeated mines which one after the other will explode with awful devastation berlin vienna and st petersburg the strongholds of despotism in europe each will totter all but the last will fall the press is powerless on the russian serf russia will be the tyrant's last citadel italy will throw off the austrian yoke and be free gregory the eighth will shortly die a wise far-seeing and benevolent priest named giovanni maria mastai ferretti born at sinigaglia and now a cardinal with the title of s s peter and marcellinus will succeed to the papal see and italy will be a republic genoa venice naples lombardy piedmont and sardinia will be sister yet sovereign states forming one union the constellation of freedom the favourite scheme of napoleon's better days at last achieving reality switzerland with her green hills and her field morgarten her priestly despots expelled shall also be free but i weary you messieurs by no means cried marrast cordially clasping m dantes by the hand i have listened in silence to your earnest exposition of the policy you suggest and so truly do i subscribe to it that henceforth i am your disciple and adopt your motto wait and hope for my own but it is nearly two o'clock in an hour the chamber sits and meanwhile messieurs interrupted m dantes i know not that we can better employ ourselves after so protracted a seance than to repair to vey fours this talking is hungry work and listening and thinking which are by far more tedious are still more so so to vey fours the seance nationale is closed cried ladru rollin laughing as the whole company descended the gloomy stairs End of section twelve section thirteen of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg the mysterious prima donna all fashionable paris was excited over the announcement of a new prima donna whose wonderful achievements in italian opera had set even the exacting critics of italy wild with enthusiasm and delight this great artiste was no other than the renowned louise d'armilly 
she had never before sung in the presence of a parisian audience but her fame had preceded her and it was accepted as certain that her triumph at the academie royale would be both instantaneous and overwhelming she was to assume the role of lucrezia borgia in donizetti's brilliant opera of that name a role in which the enterprising director of the academie royale assured the expectant public that she possessed no equal for weeks every parisian journal had been sounding her praises with unremitting zeal and now her name was as familiar as a household word in all the high society salons where the ladies and their gallants could talk of nothing but the approaching operatic event while in the cafes and on the boulevards an equal degree of interest was exhibited even the masses notwithstanding the political agitation in which they were involved had caught the prevailing excitement and the leaders of the contending parties themselves paused amid their heated discussions to talk of louise d'armilly the career of this young and beautiful artiste had been remarkable her debut had been made at brussels about two years before in company with her brother m leon d'armilly and there as well as at all the theatres of italy la scala argentina and valle they had roused a perfect storm of operatic enthusiasm the origin of this young artiste was veiled in the deepest mystery rumour ascribed to her descent from one of the oldest and most respectable families of france and domestic trials among which was a matrimonial misadventure no less than the arrest of an italian prince whom she was about to wed on the bridal night as an escaped galley slave were assigned as the cause which had given her splendid powers to the stage at an earlier hour than usual for parisian fashion never fills the opera house until the curtain falls on the second act the rue le pelletier was crowded with carriages la pignon with fiacres and the grand batelier and the passages to the boulevard des italiens with persons on foot all hastening toward that magnificent edifice constructed within the space of a single year by debray to replace the building in the rue de richelieu ordered to be raised by the government because of the assassination at its door of the duke of berry in eighteen twenty that magnificent structure which accommodates two thousand spectators with seats among the first in the orchestra stalls were beauchamp and debray whose attention was divided between the stage and the arrivals of splendidly attired elegantes in the different loges during the overture all the elite of paris seemed on the qui vive it will be a splendid house observed debray the debutante be she whom she may should feel flattered by such an unexampled assemblage of all the ton of paris orchestra balcony galleries amphitheatres lobbies and parterre were packed every portion of the vast edifice in short was thronged except a few of the loges and banoirs into which every moment brilliant companies were entering who is that tall dark military man with the heavy moustache now making his way into the minister's box asked beauchamp after a pause that man is no less a personage than the governor of algeria eugene cavaignac marshal of camp said debray he reported himself at the war office this morning and is the lion of the house ah cried the journalist and that is the hero of constantine what a frank open countenance and what a distingue bearing and manner you would not suppose all that man's life passed in a camp would you his career has i understand been remarkable said beauchamp 
very his father was a conventionist of ninety-two a famous old fellow who among other terrible things laid at his door is said to have pawned an old man's life old labadier for his daughter's honour somewhat you remember as francis i spared st valliard's life for the favour of the lovely diana of poitiers his only child his aged mother is yet living a woman of strong mind though seventy and he does nothing without her advice his brother godefroy's name was notorious as that of a powerful republican leader four years before his decease at eighteen eugene entered the polytechnic school at twenty-two he was a sub-lieutenant in the engineer corps of the second regiment in twenty eight he was first lieutenant in france in twenty nine he was captain in thirty four he was in algeria and in thirty nine his cool bold decided but discreet conduct had made him chef de bataillon despite the fact that he had incurred the royal displeasure some years before by a disloyal toast at a banquet in forty he was lieutenant colonel in forty one marshal of camp and first commander of division of telamine in forty three he was conqueror of constantine at the first siege of which i so nearly lost my own valuable head and he is now governor of algeria after service there of fourteen years and the tall and sinewy man beside him presenting such a contrast to cavaignac with his light complexion grey hair and sullen and not very intelligent expression oh that is general bugeaud by some deemed the real conqueror of algeria but he is not at all popular with the army his manners are simple and excessively blunt he is a perfect despot with his staff tis said yet he is quite a wag when in good humour and at ministerial dinners can unbend and make himself as agreeable as need be wished his voice is as harsh as a cossack's and in perfect contrast to that of cavaignac which is the richest and most musical you ever heard yet distinct emphatic and impressive bugeaud incurred intense odium with the opposition for his unwarranted severity as jailer of the duchess of berry in thirty four and his killing dulong in a duel because of a deserved taunt on the subject bugeaud did his duty said the secretary though a man of his nature could hardly perform such a duty with gentleness bugeaud is not a gentleman he knows it and don't try to seem one he is only a soldier but there comes his very particular foe general la mauriciere that magnificent woman on his arm is his wife and the sister of the lady who follows with her husband the ex-minister adolphe thiers what a contrast cried beauchamp the tall and elegant figure of la mauriciere in his brilliant uniform of the spahis half oriental half french with his lovely wife and the low swarthy little ex-minister in complete black with his huge round spectacles on his nose nearly twice the size of his eyes and a wife on his arm nearly double his stature why tears reminds me of a ghoul gallanting a parry and yet that same dark little ex-minister has perhaps in many respects the most powerful mind at all events the most available mind impelled as it is by his restless ambition in all france do you observe how incessantly his keen black eye flashes around the house beneath his huge glasses he seems perfectly aware that every eye in the house is directed toward his loged but is it true that his brother-in-law owes his rapid rise to his influence at court by no means replied debray if there is a man in the french army who has achieved his own fortunes that man is la mauriciere he went to algeria a lieutenant and bravely and gallantly has he attained his present brilliant position it was he who proposed the creation of a corps of native arab troops like the sepoys of british india 
and he was appointed colonel of the first regiment of spahis our quondam friend maximilian morel has a command in this regiment and is a protege of his illustrious exemplar the hostility between la mauriciere and bougeaud arises i suppose from the latter's detestable disposition his overbearing and dictatorial temper la mauriciere is not a man i take it to be the slave of any one rivalry in africa is thought to have originated the feud remarked debray and political differences in paris to have inflamed it bugeaud is a legitimist and le mauriciere a republican silence cried the musical connoisseurs in the orchestra the curtain rises as the curtain rose a hush of expectation reigned over the audience the hum and bustle ceased and silence most profound succeeded the appearance of the fair cantatrice was the signal for such a reception as only a parisian audience can give and the first strains that issued from her lips assured them that their applause was not misplaced and surely never was the dark duchess of ferrara more faithfully personated than by the present artiste this vraisemblance which is so seldom witnessed in the opera seemed to strike every eye her figure was tall and majestic and voluptuously developed her air and bearing were haughty dignified and queen-like her complexion was very dark but perfectly clear her forehead broad and high her brows heavy but gracefully arched her eyes large black and flashing her hair dark as night and arranged with great simplicity in glossy bands and her mouth large but filled with teeth of pearl-like whiteness contrasted by lips of coral wet with the spray the entire outline of her face was roman and exhibited in its contour and lineaments even more than roman sternness and decision and its effect was still more heightened by a large mole at one corner of her mouth and the velvet robes in which she was appropriately costumed the scene between the duchess and the spaniard gubetta was received with the utmost applause and the pathos of that between the son and his unknown mother which succeeded touched the audience to tears but when the maskers rushed in and her vizard was torn off and her true name proclaimed and amid her heart-rending wailings the curtain fell on the first act the shouts were perfectly thunderous with enthusiasm the role of Gennaro was performed by the brother of the cantatrice leon d'armilly a young man of twenty of delicate and graceful figure and as decidedly blonde as his sister was brunette nature seemed to have made a great mistake in sex when this brother and sister were fashioned indeed it seemed hardly possible that they could be brother and sister a remark constantly made by the audience and the kindred announced on the bills was generally viewed as one of those convenient relationships often assumed on the stage but having no more reality than those of the dramatis personae themselves a second pasta cried chateau renaud entering the stalls immediately on the descent of the curtain heard you ever such a magnificent contralto saw you ever such a magnificent bust asked beauchamp were it not for a few manifest impossibilities thoughtfully remarked debray i should swear that this same angelic louise d'armilly was no other than a certain very beautiful very eccentric and very talented young lady whom we all once knew as a star of parisian fashion and who the last time she was in this house sat in the same loge where now sit the african generals whom can you mean debray cried beauchamp a certain haughty young lady who was to have married an italian prince but on the night of the bridal in the midst of the festivities the house being thronged with guests and even while the contract was receiving the signatures the prince was arrested as an escaped galley slave and at his trial proved to be the illegitimate son of the bride's mother and a certain high legal functionary 
the procureur du roi now at charenton through whose burning zeal for justice the horrible discovery transpired ha exclaimed chateau renaud you cannot mean eugenie danglars daughter of the bankrupt baron whom our unhappy friend morcerf was once to have wed the very same quietly rejoined the secretary but this lady cannot be mademoiselle danglars i say absolutely for many sufficient reasons he quickly added then as if to turn the conversation he hastily remarked ah there are m dantes and m lamartine as usual together m dantes exclaimed the count in surprise looking around impossible and yet most true observed beauchamp in the third loge from the ministers to the right what a wonderful resemblance there is between those men the poet and the deputy one would suppose them brothers the same tall and elegant figure the same white and capacious brow the same dark blazing eye the same raven hair and above all the same most unearthly and spiritual pallor of complexion no wonder m dantes is pale said the count have you not heard of the occurrence of this evening in the chamber m dantes was in the midst of one of his powerful harangues against the government when suddenly in the middle of a sentence he stopped coughed violently several times and pressed his handkerchief to his mouth then taking a small vial from his vest pocket he placed it to his lips and instantaneously as if new life had entered him proceeded more eloquently than ever to the conclusion of his speech i heard something of this said beauchamp as he descended from the tribune his friends thronged around him anxious about his health he quieted their apprehensions with his peculiar smile of assurance but i observed that his white handkerchief was spotted with blood and he almost immediately left the chamber that man will kill himself in the cause he has espoused remarked debray see how ghastly he now looks but so much the better for the ministry he is a formidable foe indeed that loge contains the two most powerful opponents of the government and who are those men just entering the box asked beauchamp none other than the two rival astronomers of europe said debray and yet most intimate friends the taller and elder the one with grey hair a dark sharp bedouin countenance and that large wild black eye with a smile of mingled sarcasm and humour ever on his thin lips is emmanuel arago the other the short robust man with fair complexion sandy hair bright blue eye and vivacious expression is le verrier the most tireless star-gazer science has produced since galileo but hush the curtain is up oh it matters not said the count only genero and the spaniard appear in the second act and i have neither eyes nor ears save for the duchess to-night but who are those beauchamp where in the loge on the first tier next to the ministers and directly opposite to that of m dantes ah two officers of the spahis and two most exquisite women exclaimed debray they belong doubtless to the african party in the ministers loge your lorgnette count what a splendid woman hardly had the secretary raised the glass to his eyes before he dropped it with the exclamation a miracle a miracle what cried both of the other young men turning to the box at which debray was gazing messieurs do you remember the fair valentine de villefort whose untimely and mysterious demise all the young people of paris so much bewailed some two or three years ago and whose lovely remains we with our own eyes saw deposited in the saint meron and de villefort vault at pere lachaise one bitter cold autumn evening and there listened most patiently and piously to a whole breviary of mournful speeches declarative of the said valentine's most superlative excellence undoubtedly we remember it well was the reply then behold and never dare to doubt the reappearance of the dead again to the ocular organs of humanity valentine de villefort exclaimed the count after a careful and scrutinizing survey by all that's supernatural and more exquisitely lovely than ever
then it was true after all the strange story we heard said beauchamp of the young lady's resurrection and marriage to maximilian morel somewhere far away in parts unknown no doubt replied the count for if i mistake not and i'm sure i don't mistake now that i look more closely that stalwart splendid fellow with the broad forehead black eyes and moustache and the order of the legion of honour on his breast to set off his rich uniform of the spahis and on whose arm the fair apparition is leaning is no other than maximilian morel himself the identical man who saved my worthless neck from a yatagan in algeria how dark he's grown said debray no more so than all these african heroes for instance cavaignac and le mauricier but what a splendid contrast there is between the young colonel of the spahis and his lovely bride if such she be he dark as a corsican she fair as an english woman he upright as a poplar she drooping like a willow his hair and eyes black as midnight while her soft languishing orbs are as blue as the summer sky and her glossy ringlets as brown as a chestnut on my word said beauchamp the count grows poetical morel had better keep his beautiful wife out of the way but have you discovered who are the other couple in the box he added to the secretary who had his lorgnette in most vigilant requisition any more discoveries debray a sigh might have been heard as the secretary took his glass from his eye and replied simply yes and who now asked chateau renaud there seems no end to discoveries to-night the young man who by his decorations seems a chef de bataillon of the spahis replied debray i cannot make out but be he whom he may he is effectually disguised from his most intimate friends by his luxuriant beard and moustache as for the lady there is but one woman in the world i have ever had the good fortune to behold who could be mistaken for her and that is said beauchamp herself and who is herself lucien asked chateau renaud have you forgotten the countess de morcerf the countess de morcerf the wife of the general who was convicted by the peers of felony treason and outrage in the matter of ali tabelin pasha of yanina said beauchamp and who blew his brains out in despair added the count the same said debray she returned to marseilles with her son albert you remember albert and his strange conduct in the duel with the count of monte cristo one could hardly forget such chivalric generosity such magnificent magnanimity and such sublime self-control as were exhibited by the young man on that occasion said beauchamp it is to be hoped he was not equally forbearing toward the arabs in his african campaigns although as his name has never been seen or heard since he entered the army in all probability he was well well cried the secretary impatiently the countess retired to marseilles and there she is said to have resided in utter seclusion in company only with morel's beautiful wife devoting the vast wealth of the deceased count to philanthropic objects having received it as his widow only with the understanding it should be thus bestowed but the rumour was said beauchamp and indeed i was so assured by m de beauville himself receiver-general of the hospitals at the time that the countess gave all the count's fortune to the hospitals and that he himself registered the deed of gift oh that was only some twelve or thirteen hundred thousand francs said debray three months after her settlement at marseilles in a small house in the allee de Mayon, said to be her own by maternal inheritance a letter came to her from thompson and french of rome stating that there was a deposit in their house to the credit of the estate of the late count of the enormous sum of two millions of francs subject to her sole control and order as the count's only heir in the absence of his son two millions of francs cried the two young men in a breath even so messieurs said debray the story does sound rather oriental but i have reason to know that it is entirely true for i made diligent inquiry about it when last at marseilles 
and what took you to marseilles lucien asked the count significantly the ministry replied debray with evident confusion colouring deeply but why does not the countess marry again asked chateau renaud surveying her faultless form and face through his glass in the prime of life rich and despite her past troubles most exquisitely beautiful it is strange she don't make herself and some one else happy especially as no one could ever accuse her of having very desperately loved her dear first husband added the journalist why don't she marry lucien how the devil should i know replied the secretary in great confusion you don't suppose i ever asked her the question do you upon my word exclaimed the count laughing i shall begin to think you have if you take it so warmly but hist the bell the curtain rises we mustn't lose the third act of donizetti's chef d'oeuvre with such a lucrezia for any woman living but it was very evident that much of the magnificent performance of the debutante and her companion in the thrilling scene between the duke and duchess of ferrara and the young captain gennaro was lost to the secretary do you observe beauchamp how strangely fascinated with the new cantatrice seems the young officer of the spahis who accompanies the countess he whispered do but look he sits like one transfixed and the countess seems transfixed also though not by the same object was the reply how excessively pale yet how beautiful she is that plain black dress without ornament or jewel and her raven hair parted simply on her forehead enhance her voluptuous charms infinitely more than could the most gorgeous costume heavens what a happy man will he be who can call her his amen said debray and the word seemed to rise from the very depths of his heart but she will never marry some early disappointment even before her union with morcerf has withered her heart and the terrible divorce which parted her from him although she never loved him will keep her single for ever her first and only love is either dead or worse married to another see si, see si, lucien cried beauchamp hurriedly at whom does she gaze so intently and yet so sadly it cannot be lamartine for there sits his lovely young english wife at his side nor can it be old arago nor young le verrier and yet some one in that box it surely is monsieur dantes cried debray impossible that man seems hardly conscious that there are such beings as women his whole soul is in affairs of state his whole soul seems somewhere else just at present exclaimed the secretary bitterly look how dreadfully pale he is said beauchamp and yet his eyes fairly blaze is it the countess he gazes at is it m dantes she gazes at at that moment amid the wild farewell of the mother to her son upon the stage the curtain came down and at the same instant m dantes hastily pressed his white handkerchief to his lips and leaning on the arms of lamartine and arago hastily left the box ha the countess faints cried debray as the door closed on m dantes do they know each other then End of section 13it was early in the evening succeeding the day on which m dantes had answered giovanni massetti's letter zuleika was seated in the vast sumptuously furnished salon of the magnificent morcerf mansion now as the reader already knows the residence of the famous and mysterious deputy from marseilles she sat upon a superb green velvet-covered sofa half reclining in an indolent picturesque attitude behind the sofa and leaning over its back 
stood a young italian a perfect model of manly beauty his ardent black eyes were riveted on zuleika's blushing countenance with a look of the most profound and enthusiastic adoration while his hand held the young girl's with a gentle loving pressure which was returned with unmistakable warmth the apartment was dimly lighted and huge sombre patches of shadow lay everywhere zuleika and her lover were alone together for some time they seemed too full of happiness to speak but finally giovanni said in a soft flute-like whisper as if unwilling to break with loudly uttered words the delicious spell of his love dream zuleika darling zuleika so you did not once forget me during our long cruel separation never for a single instant giovanni answered the young girl the flush upon her cheek deepening as she spoke her hand tightening about her lovers and her lovely eyes filling with a soft fire but i sometimes feared you had forgotten me you were always present in my mind and in my heart replied the italian in a tone that thrilled her through and through stooping he placed his lips to her forehead and imprinted upon it a long and silent kiss then flushing in his turn he added still holding his head against hers from the very moment of our first meeting you have reigned in my bosom my own my love the queen of my destiny and my life oh giovanni giovanni murmured the young girl i am happy so happy he kissed her again this time upon her upturned lips that with a slight movement almost imperceptibly returned the kiss sending his blood tingling through his veins and causing him to tremble with delight from head to foot no longer able to restrain himself he hastily quitted the back of the sofa threw himself down beside her and clasping her in his arms drew her unresistingly upon his bosom once there she did not offer to stir but even nestled closer to him and pillowed her head on his broad shoulder the tumultuous beating of both their hearts was audible amid the unbroken silence that ensued with one hand the viscount tenderly smoothed her silken tresses and his arm tightened around her waist as if he had determined never to release her again your father in his letter of this morning said giovanni finally told me there was hope that you did not look upon my addresses with aversion and that i had his leave to pay court to you and ascertain your wishes from your own dear lips i hastened here this evening and m dantes himself bade me seek you in this salon i came on the wings of love and found all my fondest hopes realized that i possessed your heart as you possessed mine oh tell me zuleika that this is not all a dream for it seems too delicious to be true it is reality giovanni blessed reality answered the young girl in a low voice and do you really love me with all your soul with all my soul giovanni the ardent italian showered a flood of burning kisses upon her forehead cheeks and lips and she quivered like a leaf in his embrace then he said with a shade of anxiety in his tone and your brother esperance is he disposed to look upon me with approval you know that in rome he did not see fit to include me in the number of his friends we had a little difference you will remember and ever afterwards he was cold toward me zuleika shuddered as she recalled the fact that the little difference alluded to had been a violent quarrel that had nearly resulted in a duel between the two young men she had never known the details for both her brother and giovanni had studiously concealed them from her indeed esperance had carefully avoided all mention of the viscount's name ever since the day they had become embroiled was m dantes aware of the trouble between his son and the youthful italian she did not know but at the same time felt firmly persuaded that her father had fully investigated the doings character and family of her suitor and would not have sanctioned a renewal of his addresses to her had he not been perfectly satisfied in every respect 
she therefore answered i am altogether ignorant as to what esperance thinks of you and cannot say whether he still harbours resentment against you or not but whatever may be his opinion and feelings rest assured that he will never interfere to cause his sister an instant of unhappiness more especially as he knows that my father looks upon you with a favouring eye but how about the coldness existing between us does it still exist on both sides not on mine zuleika not on mine i forgave and forgot all long ago forgave and forgot then esperance must have wronged you he did zuleika and with the proverbial hot blood and headlong impulses of the roman youth i resented that wrong but i could not remain at enmity with the brother of the girl i loved so when i became cooler i sought him out and endeavoured to apologise and he accepted your apology he did not accept it but turned on his heel and left me without a word he evidently thought me a coward and attributed my efforts toward effecting a reconciliation to a desire to escape fighting him but why did you quarrel in the first place what was the cause of the difference between you the young italian hung his head and did not answer zuleika saw that he had grown deadly pale and she felt his hand tremble nervously freeing herself from his embrace the young girl sprang to her feet and faced him giovanni said she firmly tell me the whole story of this painful affair it is imperative that i should know it do you doubt me zuleika do you doubt me he asked bitterly and he buried his face in his hands do i doubt you giovanni no but if you love me tell me all the details of the trouble between my brother and yourself i cannot i cannot zuleika he cried command me to shed the last drop of blood in my veins for you and i will do it without an instant's hesitation but i cannot tell you that terrible tale of deceit treachery and bloodshed he had arisen and was walking excitedly about the salon his pallor had increased and he trembled in every limb zuleika stood with folded arms and gazed at him she was calm and her eyes had a look of determination the young man had never before beheld in them it filled him with dismay a few moments ago she had been all love and tenderness a yielding trusting maiden in her lover's arms now she resembled a beautiful amazon bent on achieving a victory whom nothing but unconditional surrender would satisfy the story the story she repeated tell me the story her face was as white as marble and her faultless lips seemed chiselled from stone she looked so beautiful and tempting as she stood there her surpassing loveliness enhanced by the picturesque half oriental half parisian dress she wore that the viscount felt his passion for her redoubled he flung himself at her feet and seizing the hem of her superb robe kissed it rapturously oh zuleika zuleika he cried utterly unable to restrain himself i am your slave place your tiny foot upon my neck and crush me where i lie i shall expire adoring you giovanni replied zuleika greatly moved by this display of devotion rise and be a man the italian sprang up as if he had been struck by a thunderbolt then he endeavoured to clasp her in his arms but she quietly repulsed him zuleika cried he sadly you do not love me you never loved me i have been the victim of a cruel deception if you think so answered the young girl quietly there is but one course you can pursue as a man of honour spurn the deceiver from you and never look upon her face again the young man gazed at her reproachfully what have i done to turn you thus against me he asked his tone suddenly becoming humble what have you done you refuse to reveal this mystery to me which as you yourself admit involves deceit treachery and bloodshed and which for aught i know has set an indelible stain upon your life i love you truly love you with all the passion of a woman's nature but i must know this history that i may judge whether you are worthy of my love i assure you zuleika that there is no stain upon my life that there is nothing in this history that tends in the least to dishonour me but still i cannot speak then we must separate oh zuleika zuleika do not be pitiless you will drive me mad the young girl touched a bell and ali the nubian appeared 
monsieur is about taking his departure said she to the faithful servant i leave him in your hands and without a word of farewell to giovanni she swept from the salon like a queen the viscount gazed after her with indescribable sadness pictured upon his handsome countenance then he followed ali put on his overcoat and hat and regretfully left the house end of section fourteen section fifteen of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter fourteen the minute vials even to the communists with whom he had come into such close contact m dantes the deputy from marseilles remained as much of a mystery as ever marrast though now devotedly attached to him admitted that he was totally unable to fathom either his designs or his methods of accomplishing them while lamartine who was in his company a large portion of the time when questioned concerning him replied that all he knew of m dantes was that he was a firm friend of the cause and an untiring worker in the interest of the weary and oppressed masses Debray, though he had no tangible foundation for it could not get rid of the idea that the dangerous deputy and the count of monte cristo were one and the same individual but beauchamp with the usual incredulity of journalists scoffed at the notion and chateau renaud derided it whenever it was mentioned in his presence that m dantes had great wealth was however generally admitted though whence it was derived or in what manner it was invested no one could tell it was now no longer a secret that he had purchased and resided in the magnificent mansion formerly owned by the count de morcerf in the rue de helder and this circumstance while it vastly augmented the interest attaching to him did not in the least detract from the enthusiasm felt for him by the working classes it was night in a large chamber richly furnished but dimly lighted in the mansion in the rue de helder the same apartment once inhabited by the countess de morcerf motionless and seemingly lifeless with a countenance as pale as alabaster and as still lay m dantes the deputy from marseilles although in the ashy pallor of the lips and brow and the fixed serene almost stern aspect of the immovable face might be read unmistakable evidence of an exhausting and dangerous constitutional shock to the system yet none of that emaciation over which broods the shadow of the angel of death resulting from protracted illness was there to be seen the broad white forehead the raven hair sparsely sprinkled with silver the round temples the delicately pencilled brow encircling like a sable arch the large and almond-formed eye the full calm lip and the chiselled chin and nostril all these were as perfect now as when last before the reader the cheek was perhaps slightly sunken but it could not be more pallid than when last beheld and but for that nameless quietude that rapture of repose as lord byron well expresses it that placid languor which sleeps on the features which illness always creates and which spiritualizes and intellectualizes the most common features the invalid might be supposed to be enjoying the most quiet slumber excepting the invalid there was no one in that chamber save the faithful ali who moved noiselessly about from time to time or sat immovably upon the floor and gazed on his master's pallid face as the silvery tones of the chamber clock tinkled forth the third quarter after ten the door opened and a small dark thin man with large whiskers keen penetrating eyes broad bald forehead thinly covered with grey hair and apparently about fifty years of age briskly entered it was dr orfila a name somewhat known in medical science 
approaching the bed he placed his fingers upon the sick man's pulse and gazed earnestly on his face for some time in silence strange he at length muttered the most powerful drugs in the most unheard-of quantities are powerless who then is this man whose nature so differs from that of every one else can he so have accustomed his system to poisons that as with the king of pontus they are ineffectual to help or to harm him his constitution must be iron the vitality of a dozen men is in him or he'd have been dead a month ago well it's plain he's no worse if he's no better drugs are useless and he must be left to nature and his amazing constitution this stupor this utter death of all the faculties and senses for so long a time is wonderful fever delirium anything but this death-like trance it seems as if this man had been sleepless all his life before and that now his overwrought brain and heart were compensating themselves for the toil and wakefulness of years could i but excite the nerves for some time the physician gazed in deep thought at the pale face of the unconscious slumberer suddenly turning to the nubian he said to him ali where does your master keep the drugs he has been for years accustomed to take the nubian stared in mute amazement but moved not from his rug ali said dr orfila sternly unless i see and know those drugs this night your master dies the nubian looked anxiously into the face of the physician and then as if satisfied with the scrutiny rose and with noiseless steps left the room in a few moments he re-entered and placed in the physician's hands a small casket of ebony exquisitely worked and studded with gems taking it hastily to the shaded lamp upon a table at the extremity of the chamber he attempted to open it but his attempts were vain indeed to all appearances it was a solid block of ebony and its extreme heaviness compared with its dimensions seemed to favour the idea well said the doctor returning the casket after a close scrutiny to the nubian who had followed him ali took the casket and an instantly a portion of the top flew up disclosing within the centre of the cube of ebony a cavity lined with crimson velvet and a dazzling array of minute vials of crystal each filled with a fluid pink blue green and yellow in hue while the contents of several were colourless the nubian had touched a spring concealed in the carving and known only to his master and himself the physician removed the minute vials one after another from their receptacles and held them up to the light on each was a cipher and on no two was the same most of them were quite filled with the fluid contained but some were only half full while one was nearly empty dr orfila looked closely at the cipher upon each vial as he removed it from the casket he then held it to the light to determine its particular hue or shade and sometimes withdrew the crystal stopper ground into the deep mouth touching it cautiously and quickly to his nostril or the tip of his tongue morphia synconia quinia lobelia belladonna narcotina bromine arsenicum strychnos calabrina bruchia ferruginia muttered the savant as he examined one vial after another and replaced it bruchia ferruginia ha brucine i thought as much exclaimed he holding up the vial which showed by being nearly empty that its contents had been used more frequently than those of any of the others how many drops of this is the greatest number your master has ever taken asked dr orfila the nubian who it will be remembered was a mute held up both hands with the fingers outspread and then two other fingers of one of his hands twelve drops cried the astonished physician impossible ali insisted on the assertion and yet it must be so the doctor added that would explain all 
taking the vial and a minute crystal vessel which he found in the casket he hastily but carefully dropped into the latter thirteen drops then filling the vessel with water he approached the patient who still slumbered heavily on and placed it to his lips for an instant he seemed conscious of the wish of the physician and with an effort the mixture was swallowed then he lay as still and motionless as before returning the vials in the vessel to their places dr orfila closed the casket and gave it to the nubian he then gazed long and anxiously at the torpid slumberer standing at the bedside and watching that marble face at length the clock struck eleven dr orfila started and hastily glanced at his repeater then turning to the nubian who had carried away the casket and having noiselessly returned stood silently beside him he said ali in one hour your master will be in high fever in two hours he will probably be delirious he will then sleep soundly and toward morning will wake i hope in his right mind but terribly exhausted and profusely perspiring at daylight i shall be here you must not leave him for a single instant as you value his life the nubian clasped his hands above his head and bent his forehead almost to the floor if you think necessary however ali send for me before morning the physician gave one more look at his patient pressed his fingers on his pulse placed his palm on his forehead and then taking his hat and cane left the chamber End of section fifteen. Section sixteen of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter fifteen. The Unknown Nurse. When the rumor that M. Dantes had been taken seriously ill was first circulated throughout Paris, it caused excitement in every quarter of the city filling the communists and workmen with dismay and greatly elating their opponents in the midst of the excitement a strange lady very plainly attired but whose language and bearing gave unmistakable evidence of refinement and aristocratic associations made her appearance one morning at the office of dr orfila and humbly asked permission to nurse his distinguished patient the physician somewhat surprised at such a request from such a woman immediately grew suspicious and demanded an explanation when the lady informed him that she had known the sick man in his youth and was still deeply interested in his welfare she refused to give her name but solemnly assured the doctor that should he grant her petition m dantes on his recovery would be ready to thank him on bended knees convinced at length that no harm was intended the physician gave his permission and the unknown lady was duly installed as nurse she discharged her duties with unflagging devotion and energy satisfying even the exacting nubian with whom she divided the watch at the bedside of the unconscious deputy dr orfila was delighted while esperance and zuleika were overjoyed on on the sleeper still slumbered on one two three four quarters after eleven tinkled in silvery numbers upon the delicate bell of the clock yet the closed eyelids and fixed lips moved not gave no sign but for the light though regular undulation of the chest life itself might seem to have fled for ever yet life was still there how strange the bond which connects vitality with consciousness the body with the soul and yet more strange is that phase of existence in which the one moves on without the other the mind sometimes is all life when the body is dead and oftener still is the body all life when the mind seems gone mind too may frequently act independently not only of the body as in dreams but also of consciousness and of the heart while the body as in somnambulism may act altogether alone on on the slumberer breathed on but he thought not felt not perceived not a revolution an earthquake might heave around him but the convulsive throes of man or of nature would have been as nothing to him 
the brow would have remained as calm and as cold and the cheek as pale and as still while in all human probability the faithful nubian would have sat as immovable upon his rug at the bedside of his beloved master and have gazed upon him as untiringly with his dark and sleepless eye as the last quarter after eleven sounded followed immediately by the hour of midnight a small door beside the bed noiselessly opened and a female figure in white silently entered the room but not so noiselessly was the entrance effected as to escape the ear of the vigilant ali he glanced hurriedly around then as if familiar with the apparition and anticipating its approach he rose and taking his rug to the further extremity of the chamber again laid himself down like a faithful dog though not now to watch meanwhile the lady quietly approaching the bed gazed long and mournfully at the slumberer's pale yet noble visage then kneeling she buried her face in her hands amid the coverings she was probably forty yet in the full and faultless perfection of her form in her graceful and yielding motions in her statuesque bust rounded cheek and night-black hair she would to the casual observer have indicated hardly the half of that age her figure was tall and dignified yet mobile as a willow her eyes were dark and luminous and in their profound depths slept a world of melancholy meaning her hair was simply parted on a broad forehead and was gathered in heavy masses low on the neck her lips were full and red and when parted exhibited teeth of dazzling whiteness while her complexion which was very dark was yet clear and pure as the hue of the magnolia's petal but that face was pale very pale almost as colourless as that of the quiet sleeper at its side and upon it rested an expression of love unutterable mingled with the sadness of death such was the unknown nurse the countess de morcerf as she again was an inmate of that apartment of which she had once under circumstances how different been mistress such was mercedes the catalan of marseilles again at the side of the man whom all her life she had loved with none to gainsay or forbid upon that pale and motionless countenance she gazed long and deeply and oh the world of memory that passed through her mind the world of thought and feeling that centred in that fixed gaze at length clasping her hands upon her forehead her eyes streaming with tears she bowed her face upon the bed from which she had just raised it and long seemed absorbed in prayer roused from this position by some movement of the slumberer she started up and watched him the shaded rays of the dim and distant lamp threw a faint glimmering of light upon the pale countenance but the quick eye of love instantaneously detected a change a slight flush was mounting the cheek and gentle perspiration was distilling upon the brow while a smile played on the mouth suddenly as she gazed those pallid lips moved astonished she listened marseilles beautiful marseilles said the sleeper home of my boyhood home of my heart i come then quickly and sternly came the order let go the anchor furl the sails mate take charge of the ship then the tones changed and a joyful light shot over the face as the lips exclaimed now for my father now for my love mercedes mercedes amazed the fair watcher retained her position and gazed and listened so silently and breathlessly that the quick and audible beatings of her heart might have been numbered mine mine at last continued the dreamer the marriage feast the marriage feast but instantly the expression of the voice and the countenance altered the light of joy was shrouded in clouds arrest arrest me was the exclamation me at my marriage feast a dungeon for me mercedes mercedes my love my wife o oh god it is the chateau d'if despair despair shocked terrified at the terrible energy of these words and the expression of unutterable woe that rested on the countenance of the sleeper the affrighted woman who comprehended but too well the fearful significance of the abrupt and disjointed syllables hastily arose as if to rouse the slumberer from his dream or to call on the nubian for aid 
but before she could carry the purpose into execution the aspect of the deputy's visage again had changed a dark frown settled on the brow a spirit of fixed resolve contracted the firm lip and dilated the nostril and the word vengeance vengeance in whispers scarcely audible but repeatedly and rapidly pronounced was heard a longer silence than before succeeded at length another change swept over the face and the words free free i am free burst from the lips then they murmured treasure untold wondrous wealth diamonds pearls rubies ingots of gold the mad abbe's dream was reality again the countenance darkened fourteen years in a dungeon for no crime a father dead of starvation a bride the bride of the fiend who has done all this and he a peer of france and his friends a millionaire of paris and the procureur du roi vengeance 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 there was a pause and the dreamer exultingly continued it is done the peer of france is a disgraced suicide the procureur du roi is a madman the banker is a bankrupt the dreamer again paused and his countenance once more changed alas alas man is not god vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord the innocent suffer with the guilty to avenge a wrong has been sacrificed to life and only misery has been the recompense no more no more no more of this man and man's happiness be henceforth the aim to that be devoted wealth untold the lips ceased to move gradually the high excitement of the features passed away and was succeeded by an expression of sadness and love heyday gone gone to a better world mercedes mercedes oh does she love me yet the long-lost idol of my heart the adored angel of my life come 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 as the dreamer spoke he spread wide his arms when his eyes opened and his long slumbering senses returned mercedes his own mercedes was indeed clasped to his breast mercedes mercedes he faintly whispered ah it was no dream for you are indeed beside me and mine mine for ever thine thine for ever was the reply and she clasped his feeble form to her heart as she would have clasped that of a child end of section sixteen